We're here at a makeshift airfield. It's actually a football pitch in Sarag, which is a port city on the west coast of Indonesia's main island of Java. And this is where the CNBC conversation with Indonesian President Joko Widodo begins. Selamat pagi, Pak. <laughs> How are you? He is the leader of the world's fourth most populous nation and the largest Muslim majority one. Joko Widodo is two years into his second term as president of Indonesia, and he's been under a fair bit of pressure recently from rising food costs, and more recently because of a controversial ban on the export of palm oil, which has since been rescinded. Okay, Bapa, if we can start with uh, what Indonesia is probably most famous for, that is commodities, nickel, thermal coal, palm oil, copper. Over the last two years or so, Indonesia has banned a lot of these commodities. And the outside world is asking, is Indonesia under your presidency becoming protectionist or is this resource nationalism? Is that fair? No, I think it's not protectionism, but we want that added value to be in Indonesia. Nickel we stopped in 2020 because we want to build industrial ecosystems for lithium batteries. So the added value is in Indonesia. The job opportunities will be in Indonesia and Indonesia will get the taxes. If we keep exporting the raw materials, the ones who will get the added value are other countries. So this is what we will do. Mm. And we are open. If an investor wants to come to Indonesia, go ahead. Come to Indonesia. They can collaborate with SOEs. They can collaborate with Indonesian private businesses. If they want to do it by themselves, please do. But do it in Indonesia. This means we are not closed and it's not protectionism. Okay. But Bapa, I have to say, and this is related to commodities as well, especially palm oil, your popularity over the last few months since the beginning of the year has gone down quite a bit. It's at, by some surveys, at a six-year low. Why do you think it's so low? Yeah. So the domestic palm oil price increased because there's a price hike abroad, increasing the export price. So the domestic price increased as well. Therefore, we stopped exporting so that the domestic supply would be abundant and that the price would return to normal. Our target price is bulk cooking oil to reach 14,000 rupiah. Once we achieve that, we will lift the export ban, which we did around two weeks ago. So we must prioritize the people's interests, but we will not stop exporting forever. We only stopped exporting for one month so that the domestic supply would be abundant. You've just recently reshuffled your cabinet and the trade minister, Pat Lutfi, was uh, changed for, for somebody else and there was an investigation, a probe as well. Both of those things, do you think it will make the people happier and will it also improve your ratings, your approval ratings? Just ask the people, Mr. Martin. Ask the people what it is like. I have the survey result numbers every week. So after the cooking oil price reached 14,000, the approval rating went up again. And now it's at around 69 to 70. And I need to ask this in relation to Indonesia's presidency of the G20 this year. The big theme, obviously, is for the G20 and for you, I know, is food security, yeah. right? And a lot of people from the outside world would be watching and going, if you're that interested in food security and improving it, right, shouldn't Indonesia outright say, no, we are not banning exports of any key commodities, mm. including palm oil at all, mm. to improve the global situation? Yeah. Uh 
As I mentioned before, for the palm oil, of course we will prioritize our people, but we will not totally stop it. We still export the remaining stock abroad. And yes, we need foreign exchange export earnings for the country. Exports are necessary so that other countries do not experience their own cooking oil shortage. Okay. Let's move on and talk about uh, another commodity, which is nickel. Indonesia obviously has the world's largest reserves of nickel. And there's a lot of people asking, is there about to be an announcement of Tesla's investment in Indonesia in nickel, in processing, uh, or in some form, etc. What can you tell us? A year and a half ago, I called Elon Musk and discussed the electric vehicle industry in Indonesia. Then, after the ASEAN-US summit had concluded, I met with Elon at SpaceX Starbase in the United States. We had a lot of discussions, particularly on how Tesla can build their industry from upstream to downstream, end-to-end -end starting with smelting, then to building the cathode and precursor industry, building EV batteries, building the lithium batteries and then the vehicle factory. Everything in Indonesia, because that's very efficient. That's what I offered. I also conveyed to him about the concession. You can collaborate with Indonesian SOEs, Indonesian state-owned enterprises, and work together with Indonesian private business. But you can also do it on your own, but in Indonesia. I have already prepared the land. Six weeks ago, he sent his team to Indonesia, six people who came to check the potential of nickel, to check the environmental aspects, but the car-related team has not yet arrived. I think in the near future, he will send others to see what the potentials are, but there's no decision yet. You've, you've invited Elon Musk to the G20 summit in Bali, November, and he's confirmed that he is coming. Can we expect an announcement on an investment by Tesla in Indonesia at that time? All of these are still in process. I don't want to answer too early, but this is still ongoing. Later on, if it is finalized and there's a collaboration agreement, I will convey it to the public okay. that Tesla will build their factory in Indonesia. But now everything is currently in process. Okay, but the, uh, the Chinese, the Koreans, also the Japanese, are very heavily invested in nickel mining and processing in Indonesia. The average investment is about $9 billion, so it's big, right? Do you not feel like you need, if not Tesla investment, U.S. investment to, to balance things out in the industry? I have already talked with Tesla, but my team has also talked with Ford. So we don't only talk to just one or two companies. We welcome all companies that want to build their electric vehicles, build lithium batteries, build EV batteries in Indonesia. We are open to everyone. Papa, with uh, any investment in nickel in Indonesia, the mining, the processing, the smelting takes an enormous amount of power, energy. When you are thinking about and planning your infrastructure, which is uh, one of your big themes of your presidency, are you planning to pair together clean infrastructure, hydropower, etc., together with the nickel industry? We now have an energy transition program from coal to renewable energy. It requires a lot of money and the latest technology. Therefore, we invite investors from developed countries to enter with us into renewable energies. But for new industries, for example nickel, electric vehicle industries, everything will go into green energy. This will give us a very high premium value added in the future if everything is from green energy and the resulting products are green products. This is Indonesia for the future. For Indonesia to become more green, right, because most of your power now is coal-fired, yeah. which is, is dirty, which, what has more potential? Is it hydro? Is it solar? 
Is it wind or? Uh, hydropower yeah. is the highest. And then after that, geothermal. Geothermal, okay. And then uh, solar panel. Yeah. For hydropower, we have uh, 4,400 rivers oh. in Indonesia. Mm. For example, mm -hmm. uh, in one river, in Kayan River in uh, Kalimantan, this can produce uh, 13,000 megawatt. Uh -huh. And then in Mambramo rivers in Papua, this can produce around 24,000 uh, megawatt. Wow. Imagine we have 4,400 rivers. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and then geothermal. Yeah. Our potential is 29,000 megawatt. Mm. Wow, we have a, a big potential for renewable energy. To use natural resources, yeah. to use water. Green yeah. energy. So Bapa, tell me about this uh, reservoir and this uh, dam. This, was, uh, this is very new, it's only a few years old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the last seven years, yeah. we built 29 dams and done already. Yeah. We plan 61 dam. This year, we finish nine dam again. Okay. After that, in 2024, we'll be finished 61 dam. So that's by the end of your, your second term? Yeah. Your whole plan will be completed? Yeah, complete. You're confident? On yeah. track? Yeah. Okay, that's great. That's the planning. Yeah. Mr. President, if we could uh, get back to the, the G20. It's pretty clear that very high on the agenda is that the G20 helped to formulate some sort of political solution for the war, ongoing war in Ukraine after Russia's invasion. Does Indonesia, as president of the G20 this year, does it have a proposal or a plan to bring about some sort of peace? Kita we are about to recover from a pandemic that is not yet over, and now there's the Ukraine war. This is a big problem that we have to resolve, because it will impact food prices. And this problem with food prices is a very dangerous one. Then energy prices will increase, and this will become a very big problem if not resolved. High inflation is also happening in all countries, but the most important thing that I'm concerned about is food prices. So we want the war in Ukraine to be ended, resolved with negotiation, resolved with dialogue, so that everything is over and we can focus on the economic recovery from the pandemic and the war. If not, it will never be over, and this is dangerous for all countries, but particularly developing countries. So uh, if we could continue on this theme of, uh, I guess, geopolitics, right? Uh, the US and China in contestation over the Indo-Pacific. Do you feel Indonesia, as such a huge country uh, and the biggest economy in Southeast Asia, is caught in the middle? Indonesia's politics are free and active. We are friends. We are close friends with China. We are also close friends with America. For example, with America, we had trade in the amount of 37 billion US dollars in 2021. That's huge. And America is Indonesia's strategic partner. The same goes with China. Our trade with China is huge. So both are Indonesia's close friends, mm. including other countries that are also Indonesia's close friends because Indonesia wants a peaceful world. That there's rivalry, that's fine. There's competition, that's fine. But do not make this world not be peaceful. That's not good for anyone. It's not good for any country. Okay, I need to ask you about uh, Indonesia's relationship with Australia which over many, many decades has been sometimes troublesome. Yeah. What is your relationship like with uh, the new Prime Minister Albanese? Uh, Prime Minister Albanese, 
In my opinion, with Prime Minister Albanese, Indonesia's relationship with Australia will be tighter and closer. Because Prime Minister Albanese told me that trade and investment relations will be directed towards Indonesia, ASEAN and Asia. I think the message is clear. Would it be fair to say that uh, the previous government, Scott Morrison's government, uh, was not in your good books simply because they left it until almost the last minute to inform Jakarta and yourself of the AUKUS plan? That didn't go down very well with you, did it? Uh, yang paling penting kita ingin Most importantly, we want Australia and Indonesia to have better relations in the future, in investment, in trade and others. We want it to be better. Are you more confident that uh, the Albanese government will be more consistent and more reliable to deal with? Yeah, dari pertemuan from our meeting with the Prime Minister, both of us want our relationship to be better, closer and more concrete in, once again, in investment and trade. Because now we already have Indonesia, Australia, SEPA, so this is our common goal. To be open so that goods from Australia can enter Indonesia, goods from Indonesia can enter Australia. I think this is a very good relationship. I remember shortly after you were elected, first elected, in 2014, we spoke. And at that time you were seen as a reformer. Are you still the same reformer that you were when you first became president? You can ask the people about that. Clearly, we want this country to be stable in economics and politics, so all development can be done well and that Indonesia will be better in the future. Foreign observers look especially at uh, two things that make them worry that maybe reform is stalling. Maybe not reversing, but stalling. One is how close the government is with big business again, and two is how close the government is with the military again. What would you say to those critics? In politics, my calculations are always oriented towards the benefits for the people, benefits for the country. So if it's good for the country, good for the people, I will accept all risks. So even though there are discordant and bad opinions from outside, but when I'm sure it's good for the country and good for the people, I will certainly take that decision. So Mr. President, would it be good for the country, for Indonesia, for your people, if you were to stay on beyond a second term, because there has been a lot of speculation that uh, some members of your government, very senior officials, are pushing to potentially change the constitution and extend your presidency for perhaps not another term, maybe not five years, but maybe two, maybe three. Jadi, kalau saya datang ke rakyat, so if I go and meet the people, Many of them shouted, three terms, continue. Then there are parties that told me to delay. Others asked me to continue. Then just last week, the business world also asked me to continue. I told them, our constitution does not allow it, that this would violate the constitution, and it would be bad for our democracy. I have said this four times. No. 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 No, that answer is sufficient. Okay, I don't want to push you to make it a fifth time, <laughs> but the fact is uh, you control 84% of parliament. You can change the constitution yeah, if you want. Pun. Even though, yes, even though that there's 84% support for the current parliament, I still said no. Okay, all right, that's number five. <laughs> you'll have to, you'll have to uh, excuse me. So let's get on to another issue, your son is uh, the mayor of Solo now, where, where you began your political career. Your son-in-law, Bobby Nasution, is uh, in Medan. And a lot of people look at that and go, is this dynastic <laughs> politics? That's not an appointment by the president. That's the people's vote. If my son wants to be a mayor, then he runs as a candidate, and the people say no, he will not be elected. But in fact, he was elected with 87% of the vote. 
inilah demokrasi. This is democracy. Okay. Tetapi, but the one in Medan, Medan's mayor Medan, is also the same. He was chosen by the people yeah. and only received 53% of the vote, but he was elected. That is democracy. Dynasty is by appointment, so that's different. If the people did not choose him and he only received 30%, then he lost. This is democracy. Okay. A part of your legacy, which unfortunately will not, likely will not be completed, by the time you leave office uh, at the end uh, at the end of two years from now is the new capital nusantara kalimantan huge project very expensive uh, as well if you can just walk us back through why is it you want this to be part of your legacy yang pertama firstly there is a law about nusantara capital and it was approved by 92% of the parliament. 92%, that's the first one. Secondly, we want to have even distribution across Indonesia, not just Java-centric, but Indonesia-centric. And Nusantara capital is located right in the middle of Indonesia, to the north, south, east and west. It's right in the center. And Nusantara capital will not be built in a short time. It might be completed in 15 years. Is construction on schedule, or is it delayed by COVID? Yeah, sebetulnya kalau tidak ada COVID, if COVID didn't happen, all ministry offices and the palace would have been completed. But because of COVID, at least the president's palace, the vice president's palace, and four ministry offices will be completed by 2024, and the roads for logistics will be completed. Logistiknya akan sudah selesai. Mr. President, Chiki. Uh, last question for you. One of the very practical reasons I know you wanted to move the administrative capital to Kalimantan and create Nusantara is simply because I think everybody knows the traffic in Jakarta is, <laughs> is really bad, right? <laughs> you are obviously also in touch with the current uh, mayor of Jakarta, right? What kinds of conversations do you have with him about improving the situation, traffic flow? in Jakarta now. Ya persoalan besar di Jakarta itu hanya ada dua. There are two big problems in Jakarta. The first problem is traffic. The second problem is flood. Floods should be mitigated because there are 13 rivers there. From upstream to downstream, everything should be handled. There should be dams upstream. We have built two dams to tackle Jakarta's flood problem. Sukamahi and Chiawi dams and they will be completed by the end of the year. It will reduce many flood issues for Jakarta, and 13 rivers in Jakarta shall be normalized. All of them have to be dredged, widened, so that the water can flow directly into the ocean. The second problem is traffic jams. The traffic jam issue can only be solved by mass transportation. That's why we are building an MRT, but not all of them are completed yet. We are also building an LRT, which will be completed this year. If all of them are integrated, MRT, LRT, bus, airport trains and other modes of transportation are integrated, then it will immensely reduce traffic jams in Jakarta. Without mass transportation, it won't be resolved. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a pleasure. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> thank you. That's it for the CNBC Conversation with Joko Widodo. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Martin Sung. We'll see you next time.